Praise be Jesus and Mary. Saint Fidelis, whom we celebrate today, was a Franciscan saint, a Capuchin. He was born in 1578 in Germany in a city called Sigmaringen, and then became a lawyer, gave up that career, gave up all the things of this world to serve God alone, became a Franciscan. And then as a Franciscan, he was sent to preach to Protestants, to heretics in the Raetia region, so today, Austria. He died as a martyr, preaching the Catholic faith, trying to win souls back to the church in 1622. And years ago, when I was still in formation, in 2011 specifically, I was in that town where he was martyred, Feldkirch, and in the church, the Capuchin church that is in that city. Two amazing relics are kept of this saint. One, that mantle that he was wearing, when he was killed with a giant blood stain on it. That same blood that gushed forth from his head when he was struck with an ax is still there on that mantle, which is kept as a relic. And the skull itself, the skull of St. Fidelis is there too with a big hole in it that the ax made when it was swung at his head. So I was able to venerate his relics and they made a deep impression on me and, and I think they would on anybody who had the grace to venerate them. This martyr for the faith, this martyr for church unity. Now, he preached to win souls back to the church. And why is that an important thing? Because those who are voluntarily outside of the Catholic Church, who knowingly and willingly are outside of the Catholic Church, cannot save their souls. At that time, during the time of St. Fidelis, that schism was still very fresh. The revolt of the Protestants was still very fresh. It was very difficult to think how somebody could be outside of the Catholic Church through no fault of his own. Again, the schism was very fresh. It was very fresh in people's minds that the Protestants were breaking away from the Church of Always. That there was really a novelty, a revolution going on. It's difficult, therefore, to think that anybody could be in that situation through no fault of his own. Today, we stress the fact that those who are involuntarily outside of the Catholic Church, who are outside but do not realize that Christ wants them inside, such people can save their souls. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we still have this obligation to win souls for the church, to work for one flock under one shepherd. So why? Why be anxious? If people who, through no fault of their own, are outside of the Catholic Church may be saved, why be anxious for Protestants? Why be anxious for non-Christians? Why be anxious? Well. Because first and foremost, the fact that people outside of the church may and can possibly save their souls doesn't mean that they will because there's a great difficulty there. If they do save their souls, it is only with the greatest difficulty because in the church, we truly have something more than people outside of the church. Christ has really given us something, something precious, something inestimably precious, something that makes salvation much easier for us Catholics. And those who are not Catholics simply do not possess it. And salvation for them, though possible, is difficult and even extremely difficult. This example just comes to mind, but still, just an example, an insufficient to really describe the reality. But the example, people can and do really climb Mount Everest and without supplemental oxygen. They really do that. It's possible. People have done it, and new people do it all the time. But that's really difficult to do. Possible? You bet. Of course you can do it. But would you do it just because it's possible? Well, with great difficulty. 
And such is the, the situation of those who are, even through no fault of their own, outside of the church. That's why the popes, Pius IX and Pius XII, in very explicit terms, but not only they, just those are the two that come to mind, always invite those who are outside to come in, because outside they are in a situation in which their salvation is at the very least uncertain. That difficulty is great. But then the second question comes, my goodness, yes, people can be outside of the church through no fault of their own, but is that really their situation? Are they outside really with no fault? Are they really cluelessly outside of the Catholic Church? Or are they outside through some negligence, through some fear to enter inside? We don't know the answer to this question for each and every individual case, but it's still a good question. And a reason to be, so to speak, in a healthy apostolic way, anxious for the salvation of non-Catholics. Are they outside through no fault of their own? Another example, these are anecdotal, so they, you know, they don't mean much, but an anecdotal example, just recently reading a news article, in passing there was mention of a pretty prominent non-Catholic who nevertheless demonstrates a lot of sympathy for Christianity and Catholicism, but nevertheless is not Catholic for some reason. And again, we don't know why, there's always a lot more to the life of an individual that, 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 than what we can know about him in the news. But nevertheless, he's for some reason not becoming Catholic, although he has a lot of sympathy. And in this article, one person trying to excuse this non-Catholic says, you don't understand. If so and so became Christian, that would hurt his family so deeply that he cannot do it. So that's why he can't become Christian. He can't cause chaos and disruption and pain in his family. That's why he can't become Christian. While well, humanly speaking, okay, it puts things into context. Our Lord nevertheless says, unless you hate mother and father, brother and sister, you know, these words of course need to be explained. The hatred there is not literal. But unless you love me more than mother and father and your family, you cannot be my disciple. So people who are outside of the Catholic Church, are they outside for some sufficient reason? Good question. It's easy to make insufficient excuses. That's why the popes say, don't live in anxiety. Work for the salvation of souls by bringing them into the church, converting them to the Catholic faith putting them in that place where they do have all that God wants us to have in order to be saved. A last good question would be, well, can Catholics be saved? Well, the answer is, of course we can. But nevertheless, in Fatima, Our Lady said, indiscriminately, souls are going to hell, Catholics and non-Catholics, why? Well, the non-Catholics, either because they face such difficulties that, that they cannot overcome them. They try to climb Mount Everest without oxygen and they make a valiant effort, but they fail. Or because they remain outside of the church culpably. But Catholics too, why? Because they don't make use of the means, the aids given to them, the sacraments and the magisterium and the communion of saints and devotion to Our Lady. Even Catholics can be lost if they don't make use of what has been given to them. And we have this obligation to use everything that God offers us as assistance to save our souls. In fact, from him, to him, from him, to whom, more has been given, more will be asked. So if God has given us a lot in his great mercy, he expects us to use a lot of the help that he has given us, to use all of it for the salvation of our soul. And if he has given it to us in his great and infinite mercy, maybe all of us here have been born into a Catholic family and haven't had to begin outside and then make that difficult journey into the church. That's difficult, and yet God asks that of some people. 
Maybe he hasn't asked it of any of us here. In his great mercy, he has made it really easy for us. He has given us everything, but then he expects us to use it because we really need it. In our misery and weakness, we have been equipped with everything and God expects us to use everything, especially devotion to Our Lady. If we've been given that, it's because we are total babies that can do nothing without Our Lady. And we need her to have that childlike disposition to then do everything else. Let us make use of what God has given us. Much has been given to us, much will be asked of us. But if we take Mary, Our Lady, into our homes, everything else comes through her mediation, through her intercession. It's the jewel, the crowning gift of, of what God wants to give to us. If we've been given it, let us receive it, let us live it, and let's try to share it with all those who are as yet without it. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. Amen.